calling Facebook up and hello Facebook. All right, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here. Welcome to my second Thursday night uh, program. Let's jump right in. We're going to start out with a word of prayer because as always, I have a lot to say. Thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you, Lord, for your mighty word. Thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, by whom we are justified before you by faith in him and his blood. And we can't ever thank you enough. God, we can't ever thank you enough for your wonderful salvation in Christ. So I surrender. Lord, I say not my will, but thine be done. So speak through my mouth. I surrender my brain, my mind, my heart, my words, my tongue to the Holy Ghost. Speak through me, Father, so that what you want uh, released into the body of Christ and all that might hear it might be uh, what happens tonight, oh God, that you are in all the words that I speak, that we can get an insight into your counsel, your commandments, because in your commandments and in keeping thereof, there is life, oh God, and when we reject the word of God, there is death. So please, oh God, speak through my mouth. Let the life-changing word of God come through in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you might be glorified, and that the saints might be edified, and that the demons might be terrified. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. All right. So I'm going to give you a lot of information, so you're going to have to watch this video more than once. Okay? All right. <clears throat> We're going to start out with my tagline. What's my tagline? God already told you what was going to happen if you would just listen to the prophets. One more time. God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. We're going to see how real that is tonight and what we're studying tonight. Okay, so I want to say uh, welcome to all my audiences. Welcome to my Facebook Live audience. Welcome to my Periscope audience. And for those of you that are checking this out on the replay on either of those channels or on YouTube, welcome to YouTube. Thanks to those of you that are tuning in live. Thanks for you uh, that are watching the replay. This, what we do on Second Thursday Nights, is called No More Genies. That's my No More Genie series. Now, what is that about? <clears throat> That's about breaking up and destroying the genie concept of God, the magic concept of God, the idea that God is a genie, and bringing us back to true faith because we're going to study what the Word actually says, and we're going to work on throwing out all of our wrong ideas so that we can replace our wrong ideas with the right ideas according to scripture and stop thinking of God as some kind of genie and stop thinking that faith is magic because faith is not magic. Okay. So I encourage you to go back and, and watch all of the videos in this series. Go all the way back to number one. This is number eight. This is video series number eight. So I encourage you to watch it from the beginning because I lay the foundation for everything I just said in the first video. And then we start dealing with different subjects. So tonight, what we're dealing with is Save My Marriage Part 2. Save My Marriage Part 2. If you go back and watch Part 1, Part 1 was rough. If you watch this one tonight, Part 2 is going to be rough too, but in a different kind of way. You'll see what I mean. All right, so please like and share. Uh, the goal is to get this prophetic word to millions of people. Whenever God sends a prophetic word, it's designed to change a city, change a nation. Okay, you are never the same whenever the prophetic word of God comes, okay? Even if you don't receive it, that was a moment in time you had a chance to hear God. And if you say no, your destiny splinters off in the wrong direction. Did you know that? Did you know that when the prophetic word of God comes forth and you don't receive it, your destiny splinters off in the wrong direction? And you might eventually find yourself so far out of the will of God that you've completely missed your destiny, which is entirely possible. Okay, I may need to do a session on that because that's something we don't teach in church. You can completely miss God and you can completely miss your destiny in this life. Yes, you can, because there are people in the Bible that did it. So I probably need to do a teaching on that, but that's not our teaching tonight. Okay, uh, so please like and share when you watch this video. Uh, if you want to give donations, I have a PayPal.me link. On my Facebook Live page, uh, DT2 Prophet David Taylor on Facebook, my Periscope profile, Prophet David Taylor, and my Twitter feed, PDT SOTC. You can also make a, a tax deductible donation to my Prophet David Taylor 
not-for-profit company, 501c3 on Amazon Smile. Now, where to find me is I always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT, so you know it's me. So if you want to look up anything I've done online, it will be hashtagged with hashtag PDT for Prophet David Taylor. I'm here live on Facebook and Periscope every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time on Sundays, and then on the second Thursday, which is tonight, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for my No More Genies series, okay? All right. So uh, everything that would happen last week is far too much to review. So again, I encourage you to go ahead on and look at last week's video, but I do want to review one point. One of the points that we need to go over tonight before we jump into our lesson tonight is Revelation 4.11. Revelation 4.11 says, out of the King James, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You need to understand that that is the choke point, or one of the choke point scriptures in the Bible. And by choke point, I mean it's a make or break scripture. It's one of those scriptures where either you're going to get past it or you're not. And it's not just for us humans. It's for everything God created. Everything God created has to understand that he is God and you are not. It says, for thou hast created all things were all products of his mind and his hand. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. In other words, God made what he wanted and he made, them, he made things like he wanted them. They were created for his pleasure. The same God that made the butterfly made the bullfrog. The same God that made the eagle made the vulture. The same God that made the comet made the cockroach. Okay? It's all created by him and for his pleasure. And not only did God create it, and not only is it for his pleasure, but God sustains it by the power of his word. And so you must understand as a created being that God is the inventor. Okay? And it is, it is our human pride that blinds us to that truth. And most people are going to spend their lives just trying to have their way. Because it doesn't occur to you to ask the maker, ask the inventor, how does this go? You just think you know. And that is never more true than in the area of marriage. Because we spend so much of our energy trying to make our marriages and our relationships go the way we think they should go without bothering to ask the maker, how does this work? Do you understand? So again, Revelation 4 and 11 is a choke point scripture. It's a choke point. You are either going to get past it or you're not. If you don't get past the fact that he is God and you are not, you are never going to be able to make your life work right. I mean, in 105 years of living, if you live to see over 100 years of life on this planet, you are never going to be able to get your life working quite right until you understand that he is God and you are not. He's the inventor. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. Sexuality, money, your career, hard work, uh, uh, astronomy, the constellations, the stars, geology, geography, chronology, uh, etymology, entomology. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what discipline you're talking about, and it doesn't matter what kind of creature you are. He is God, and you are not. He's the inventor. And if you don't get past that, I'll say it again, you're going to end up wasting all of your days on earth. And you're going to stand before God and you're going to try to argue with God with all the things that you think are right. And God's just going to shake his head. Okay? Because he is God and you are not. That's the choke point. Why is that so important? And why do I lead with something like that? Because when you're dealing with something like marriage, marriage is one of those things that we hold the tightest. Okay? We hold on to it the tightest because we want to hold on to our ideas, okay? And the only way your marriage is ever going to work is if you let go of your ideas 
and you start walking in what thus saith the Lord, the inventor of marriage. Most people will not hear what I just said. That's why you can't name 10 marriages that you know that you trade places with. Think about it. Out of all the people that you know, you can't name 10 couples where you look at their relationship and say, I want that. Think about it. Do you know why that is? Because most of us are going to spend our lives just trying to have our way. Instead of asking the one that invented marriage, how does this work? Okay? Now, <clears throat> last week I talked about uh, some of the reasons we get mad at God and, and a lot of our wrong ideas. Uh, this week what I want to talk about is, is that too many people address marital issues after the fact or relationship issues after the fact. What do I mean by that? I mean you come up pregnant and you hadn't planned on being pregnant. Or you come up pregnant very, very young. You're 13, 14, 15 years old. Or you come up pregnant out of wedlock or you have an affair or two or 17. Uh, you find out you have an STD, and maybe you have an STD that there's no medical cure for. Maybe you have an STD that you can't get rid of by natural means, okay? Uh, maybe you've already engaged in domestic violence. Maybe you've been the aggressor, or maybe you've been, uh, you've been attacked by someone that you have a romantic or sexual relationship with. And it seems to me that we tend, to, we tend to be reactive when it comes to these relationships. We wait until something happens, and then we try to fix it. Let me say that again. We wait until something bad happens, and then we try to fix it. So the Holy Spirit was showing me how there are so many scriptures in the Bible where God addresses these issues before we get involved with people. Before we get involved, uh, let me tell you something about marital counseling. Now, I'm not against marital counseling, and I'm not trying to disparage marital counselors on any level. But I will say this. When are people listening? At the beginning of the relationship, when you're in the infatuation stage, stage you're just so in love, you can't keep your hands off each other. You're just staring at each other's eyes. Everything is just brand new. You're just goo goo eyed just, everything they do is cute. You can't get enough. Okay? So when you go for counseling, premarital counseling, are you re really listening to what they're saying? Or are you busy just making the Google eyes? You're thinking about all the way this is going to be once we get married. Are you really listening to what they're saying? Um, if you have a big fight, a big old blowout fight, okay, and you decide that you need to go to counseling or somebody drags you to counseling, Okay, if you've had a big fight or you've been fighting for a while, you, uh, when you get into counseling, you just want someone else to agree with you while you beat up your spouse. So you want to take them in somebody's office and then you want to make a list of all the wrong things that they have done in the relationship and then you want that third party, that counselor, to agree with you how wrong they are and how much they need to change. So are you really listening? Scenario number three, um, let's say you've decided to divorce. If you've decided that the marriage is over and you're going to get out of it and you go to counseling, are you really listening? Are you really trying to save your marriage? Or are you just trying to put on a front so you can self-righteously say, well, I went to counseling, child, I tried. Really? Are you listening? So at what point are people listening to marital counseling? That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's wrong and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying at what point are people listening is my question. At what point? Okay? So that's when the Spirit of God started to show me how the Lord has addressed so many of these situations before we get involved. Before we get involved with people. Before we get involved. Okay? But I must, must tell you this. A lot of what I'm going to read tonight is going to be offensive. A whole lot of people are going to be offended. I'll stop by to tell you that God is not American, okay? The Bible is not politically correct, and the Holy Ghost is not black. One more time. God is not American. The Bible is not politically correct, 
and the Holy Ghost is not black. Okay? So all them wrong ideas you got in your head, you got to throw them out. And so I remember when I was 19 years old, I, I kind of said something to the Lord. I kind of threw it out. It's what I call maybe like a, a joke prayer. I don't really take it seriously. And I discovered that God answered me on what I was talking to him about. And not only did he answer me, but he answered from some deep desires in my heart that I hadn't even spoken to him. And I was blown away. And, and I really started to fall in love with Jesus in a whole new way because that's when he explained to me, that's when he showed me that he knew what was going on inside of me. And I said to the Lord, wow, I had no idea this kind of stuff was in the Bible. And the Lord said this to me and it changed my life. When I'm 19 years old, he said, no, son, it's not that I haven't addressed the things you need to know about life in the Bible. It's just that you won't hear them in church. <laughs> and that's what started me on a whole new journey, which is why you hear me say all the time, you need to read the Bible for yourself because there's a whole lot of things you're going to find in Scripture that you ain't going to never hear in church. And there's nothing wrong with church. Are we supposed to go to church? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with none of that. But I'm saying some of this stuff you're going to never hear it in church because it's offensive. It's going to cut through a whole bunch of stuff that people believe that ain't right. You are never going to hear it in church. Okay? All right. So having said that, let's dive into tonight's lesson. Tonight's lesson, again, is about all the ways... Amen. Amen, Sister Denise. Tonight's lesson is about all the ways that God warns us before we get involved. Because we need to stop being reactive. We need to stop waiting until there's been some type of blowout or calamity or emergency, or we realize we married the wrong person, or we pregnant and now we got to deal with it, or now we got STD, got some bad news from the doctor. We need to stop being reactive as Christians. Because one of the advantages we have as a Christian is that we have God's mind and we have God's spirit. That's an advantage. Okay? But many times it's not presented that way. So we're going to deep dive into some scripture tonight. Some stuff that you may have never heard before and that you're probably not going to hear in church. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to read you is the side dude chapter. Because there's a chapter in the Bible about being a side dude. Okay? Okay? So the woman is married, and you her side man. I, I bet you didn't know there's a chapter in the Bible about that, did you? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay? All right, that chapter is Proverbs 7. So let me pull that up. Okay? Proverbs chapter 7. I'm going to be reading um, out of the King James. Okay? Okay, and there's a, there's actually a whole relationship and sex chapter in the Bible, and I'm going to read some of that too. But right now we're going to read out of Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, chapter 1, coming out of the King James. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Okay, Solomon is saying that the word of wisdom or the word of God has to be your center focus, but you have to make it be that. And he says, if you write them, uh, bind them on your fingers and you keep God's word right in the center of your eye and you write them on the table of your heart and you say that I'm tight with wisdom, Okay, but then it says that it may keep thee from the strange woman. Now that word there in English that's translated to English, strange, it really means foreign. So what he's really saying there, the foreign women, what that means is that women that weren't Jews, women that were Gentiles in the Old Testament, because God made it clear to the Hebrews over and over and over again that they weren't supposed to get involved with Gentiles. Uh, Gentiles are just anybody that's not a Jew, but they worshiped false gods. They worshipped everything but Jehovah, the God of the Jews. And God told them over and over and over again, do not get romantically or sexually involved 
with these strangers, with these foreigners, with these people that are not a part of our covenant. They're not a part of what I'm doing with the Jews. They're Gentiles. So when he says, keep thee from the strange woman, he means the foreign woman. Someone that wasn't a Jew in that context. In our context, it's talking about somebody that's not a Christian and not spirit-filled. Because the spirit that's in us as believers is the Holy Spirit of God. The spirit that's in the people in the world is the carnal spirit, the fleshly spirit, and whatever else the devil's got going on in the mind and the heart of a sinner. So the scripture is saying here is that if you listen to the wisdom of God, it's going to keep you from getting involved with people that are strange to you, the foreign women, the foreign people that aren't a part of your covenant, your walk with God. And he says, the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked through my casement, this is King Solomon talking, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the ewes, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her, went the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. So in other words, Solomon said, he creeping, okay? And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, so she dressed like a hoe. And subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, as in the Bible. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in our house. She fast, can't stay home. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth and waited every corner, always running the streets, came, go home. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face, said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Okay, what does all that mean in plain English? She said, I caught him and kissed him and said, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. That's somebody trying to, to virtue signal. That's somebody trying to front like they've got better character than they do, okay? Like they're all full of integrity, you know, I got my peace offering, I paid my vows, I've dotted my I's and crossed my T's. Uh, therefore, I came to meet you diligently to seek thy face, and I have found you. She said, I'm just out here looking for you, which is a lie, because Solomon just said she all over the place. This is just a man she caught. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt, Perfumed my bed with myrrh, owls, and cinnamon. She went straight from, I wanted to meet you to, let me tell you what I did, what I set up in my bed. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Make love to me all night. Let us solace ourselves with loves. And here come the next verse. Verse 19, for the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. She married. <laughs> Verse 20, he had taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. She married, she said, my husband out of town. And he going to come back home at the end of whatever his business trip is. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. And with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hastes to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Solomon said, you get involved with a married woman, you become a side dude. It's just like an ox going to the slaughterhouse. It's just like a fool. When they talk about the correction of the stocks, that's an old school way of saying, when they used to put you in jail, they used to put you in stocks in public where they would clamp the clamp down on your neck and put your hands in the bonds and put your feet in it. It's not like incarceration like we do now. They would actually clamp you in stocks and wooden stocks and hold your wrist and your neck and your ankles that way. So he said, it's like a fool going to the correction of the stocks till a dart strikes through your liver. So if you can imagine a spear or a dart cutting right in your liver, as a bird hastes to the snare and knoweth not that it's for his life. So in other words, when you said a bird trap, the bird that run, that's running toward that trap, don't know that that trap is going to kill you. It's the end of you. Okay. Verse 24, hearken unto me, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not, let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, 
Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Let's look at the choice of words there. He said, decline. Get involved with a woman like this is lowering your moral integrity. It says, go not astray. Get involved with a woman like this is taking you off the path of life. For she hath cast down many wounded. Okay? You get pulled off of wherever you were doing and you're wounded. Many strong men have been slain by her. Solomon doesn't have anything to good, good to say about this relationship. Her house is the way to hell. <laughs> That's verse 27. I'm not making that up. Her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. So what did Solomon just tell you? Solomon just told you that one of the worst things in the world you could ever do is be a side dude to a married woman. Don't listen to what she's saying. Don't listen to her talk about how she's lonely and she got herself together and she made the bed already for you because my husband's out of town and he's not going to be home for a week. So let's just make love all night and we'll comfort ourselves. Solomon said, that's going to be the end of you. By the time that story finishes, it's going to be just like an ox going to the slaughter. And Solomon said, you're going to decline. You're going astray. You're going to be cast down. You're going to be wounded. You're going to be slain. You're going to hell and it's full of death. How much more plain can he make that? Now, can you see how some people get involved with married people and then maybe try to replace their spouse and then wonder why later on the relationship didn't work out? Because you, <laughs> because you can't start a relationship being a side dude. That's why. You can't be getting involved with married women. It doesn't matter what she says. doesn't matter how, you know, me and my husband, whatever. If she got a husband, you need to run screaming. Okay, because you can't be getting involved with married women. You can't be a side dude. Solomon spells it out there for you in detail. Now, can you see if that's how you got in your current relationship or your current marriage? Can you now see why stuff ain't working out? Because it's like Dr. Phil said, if they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. If you met a married woman that wouldn't even stay in her own home and she's going out somewhere to hook up with you. Don't you know that if you replace her husband and you become the husband, she's going to do the same thing with other men? Don't you understand that? Okay, pray for my marriage breakthrough. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, pray for Wednesday, oh God, that you give her the marriage breakthrough that she seeks. Oh God, that you give her the right man, or if she's already married, oh God, that you give them the revelation that they need to build their marriage according to godliness. And I thank you for what I believe you for in Jesus' name, amen. You see that? Do you see how when you start out that way, that's why you're having all these problems? Haven't you ever seen people who get involved with married people and they try to justify it? They try to say, no, 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 you don't understand. We're in love. No, 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 you don't understand because the sex is really good. You know, see, the whole bunch of stuff and, and the Bible tells you all that what you're saying is wrong. You can't be listening to some female that has a husband but telling you that she's pursuing you and then you become the side dude. Solomon said, that's going to be the end of you. Before that story ends, it's going to be the end of you. Okay? Yeah, I know y'all ain't never heard that in church before, but it's true. Okay? All right. We're going to move on to Proverbs 21 and 29. Uh, we're going to re actually read three scriptures about anger and contentious women. Proverbs 21, 19. I'm sorry. Did I say 29? I meant 19. Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. That's 2119. Proverbs 25, 24. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Proverbs 27, 15. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. What does contention mean? It means people that like to argue. <laughs> it means the people that are not happy when things are peaceful. It means people that like to stir up stuff just because they like to stir up stuff. They're not content for there to be peace and harmony and all different kind of stuff. They're just going to keep ba 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 until they start a fight. And Solomon says three times it's better to live out somewhere outside the city in the wilderness than when the contentious and angry when women want to fight all the time. It's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than when a brawling woman in a wide house. That's a woman going to fight you toe to toe like she was a man. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Just constant complaining, 
like that rain constantly hitting your head, that's actually Chinese water torture. Rain constantly hitting your head, constant complaints. See that? So why is that in the Bible? To let you know that if that's how your relationship is before you get married. How you think it's going to be once you get married, if it was like that before? If every conversation y'all had was a fight before y'all even jumped the broom and got married, that doesn't tell you anything? Okay? All right. Let's look at um, Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. This is for uh, when women go through their bad boy phase. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, or you will learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. How much more plain can the Bible make that? It says, make no friendship with an angry man. If you're dating a dude, and you see he's given to temper, and every time y'all talk, look like he's losing his temper. Look like he's just going off. The Bible says, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man, thou shalt not go. Thou shalt not go. Okay? As you're getting to know someone, if they're given the temper, that temper going to flare up. At some point, that temper coming forward. And when you're dealing with men, now, let me tell you something about angry men. Uh, sometimes people don't really understand angry men, but other men understand men. Okay? And I will tell you, when you're looking at angry men, I will tell you where that's coming from. Men that are extraordinarily angry like that aren't happy with who they are and they aren't happy with where they are in life. That's the root of all that anger. When you see men just, oh, just going off, just all loud, just always upset, just easily triggered every little thing, um, just getting violent at every chance, throwing stuff and whatnot, just going all off on the regular, you know, everybody, you know, loses their temper every now and then. Everybody has a bad day. You know, we watched Steve Kerr lose his, lose his temper last night with Golden State, State game because he's normally not giving a temper. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about people that lose their temper on a regular. Men that lose their temper on a regular. Men that are operating like that are not happy with who they are. And men that are operating like that are not happy with where they are in life. That's why they're angry. Now... Generally, as males, we're not going to articulate that. We're not going to say it like I just said it to you. But that's the root when you see men acting that way. They're just not happy with who they are. And they're not happy with where they are in life. And so they're given to all that rage. So the Bible says you're not supposed to go with people like that. With a furious man, thou shalt not go. Or you will learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. And that's how many, uh, so many women end up in these domestic violence situations. That man showed you that crazy temper before y'all ever got involved. It flared up somewhere. And God is telling you that you're not supposed to be going with dudes like that. Okay? Because it said you're going to learn his ways. You're going to end up being angry too. Now, I know that's true. Haven't you ever seen people that have been together for a while and all they do is fight? Things get to the point where all they do is fight. Things get to the point where they can't talk without screaming. Have you ever seen that? So remember that tonight's lesson is that God has warned us about people not to get involved with. That's going to offend a lot of people. And my response to that is, oh, well, it's the scripture. It's what thus saith the Lord. God has warned us before we get involved with people what to look for because so many times we're waiting until after the fact. Y'all got married, you're in this situation, and the next thing you know, there's all this domestic violence. But you saw that man's temper before you walked down the aisle. I think it was, I think it was Yolanda Adams, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to misquote it. But I think it was Yolanda Adams who said one time uh, when she first got married, she felt the Lord tell her, speak to her, say, don't walk down the aisle. Don't marry that man. She's standing there in the back of the church in her wedding dress. And she heard the Holy Ghost say, don't do this. But she got married anyway. And then she said it was a really, really bad situation. That's how deep our pre-warning system is. God will pre-warn us if we're getting involved with the wrong person. But what's the problem? Why don't we want to hear it? 
we don't want to hear it because we've already made up our minds or maybe we've already started having sex. And if you've already started having sex, you're taking two and you're making them one. So you've already started to bind yourself to that person. You're already involved. And once you start having sex with somebody, you're not going to want to let them go. Because sex is designed to take two and make them one. Sex is designed to release those endorphins inside of your brain. Sex is designed to make take two and make them one. You're not going to want to let them go once you start sleeping with them. Okay? But the Lord has already told us, man, if you, if you see that violent temper, you're not supposed to go with a dude like that. Okay? All right. I know this is rough, but how have we been doing it, doing, doing it our way? If we don't know so much about relationships, then why are there so many relationships in trouble? Why is the divorce rate so high? Why are there so very few relationships you can look at and say that you want that? If we know so much, we need to be listening to the word of God. You need to throw out your American concept of God. God is not American. You need to throw out your political uh, correctness concept because that is not how the Bible is written. Okay? And you need to get rid of your, get rid of your narrow view of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost ain't black. Okay? All right. Let's look at some more scriptures. Uh, oh, boy, this one's a doozy. A doozy. We're going to look at uh, Matthew 7, 6. Matthew 7, 6 is deep. People quote this all the time, but people don't know how deep this is. Matthew 7, 6, what does it say? It says, it's a famous scripture about pearls before, pearls before swine. It says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Good God Almighty. First of all, the Lord said, there are things that are holy and there are things that are pearls. Did you know you have holy things? Did you know that you have pearls? Let me name some of those things for you so you can understand them. One of the pearls you have in your life is your time. Your time is a pearl. Your time is a precious thing. And you need to be careful how you invest it. You know, another uh, per, uh, pearl that you have, a precious thing that you have, is your name. Mm -hmm. I mean, like your reputation. Your name. That's a pearl. It's so powerful to have a good name. A good name will open doors for you before you ever show up. And a bad name will shut them. Shut them right quick before you even show up on the scene. Okay? What is holy? Well, uh, our spirits, because inside of our spirits is a place where the spirit of God dwells. That means that you can need to be careful what you let get in your spirit because the Holy Ghost is in there. That's a holy place. Any place where the Lord is is holy and the Spirit of God dwells in our spirits. Let me tell you another holy place. It's a woman's uterus or the womb. Why is that a holy place? Because that's where God knits together human beings. That's where he puts people together. When a, a woman is pregnant, God is literally knitting that human life together, knitting that spirit, knitting that soul, knitting, knitting that body, and making a person, making a baby. The uterus, the womb of a woman, is a holy place. It's the place where God puts human beings together. You see that? Okay, so the Lord said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Now, what I'm about to say is why you don't hear people talk about this in church. Jesus, because that's a direct quote from Jesus, by the way. The Lord said that. The Lord said there are some people that live on the dog level and some people that live on the pig level. There are some humans that live like dogs and pigs. The Lord said that. How do you know if you're dealing with someone living on a dog or a pig level? How do you know? Okay, I'll tell you how you know. You know because of exactly what the Lord said. What do dogs do when they're horny? What do dogs do when they're when they're in heat, they'll hump anything. <laughs> you sitting down watching your TV, just enjoying a game, and here come your dog. Your dog's in heat. Your dog just grab your leg and start going to town. And you have company over, so of course your dog waits until you have guests, and he come right there in the TV room and just start going to town on your leg, or a fire hydrant, or somebody else's leg. 
because they're dogs. <laughs> and when they get in heat, they tend to hump anything. So the Lord said there's some people who live like that, and we know that's true. There's some people who have sex with anything and anybody. Then the Lord talked about swine. Now, if you know anything about Jewish people, if you know anything particularly about Orthodox Judaism, you know that the pig is one of the worst things in Jewish culture because pigs are nasty. Because pigs eat anything and they're just, you know, they're really bad for you, you know. It's a shame that bacon and ham taste so good because the pig is really bad for you. And Orthodox Jews eat kosher. They don't eat the pig. And many times when people are trying to improve their health, they drop pork. It's because pigs tend to be kind of disgusting animals. Unfortunately, their flesh tastes good, but they themselves are disgusting animals because they eat slop. Because pigs will eat anything, man. And not only do they eat slop, they wallow in slop. They're comfortable in slop. Let me say that again. Pigs are comfortable in slop. So the Lord says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give something precious that you have to somebody that's comfortable living in slop. Then he goes on to say, lest they trample them under their feet. So God just tell you that people that are living on the dog level and the pig level are not going to have any appreciation for the good way you're treating them. Haven't you ever seen that? Maybe you've done it. Haven't you ever seen somebody that's going out of their way, breaking their neck, bending over backwards, trying to treat somebody well, and it looks like the better they treat their partner, the more ugly treatment they get back? That's a sign. Because the Lord said they're going to take your holy things they're going to take your pearls, your precious things, and they just go walk on them. Your virginity don't mean nothing to people like that. Your time don't mean nothing to people like that. Your womb don't mean nothing to people like that. Your name and your reputation doesn't mean nothing to people like that. The Lord always said they're going to trample it under their feet. They don't care about stuff like that. Haven't you ever seen that? Or maybe you've done it. Maybe you've made the mistake of getting involved with somebody that had no regard for the you were treating them as well as you knew how, and it looked like they just kept spitting back in your face, like it didn't mean anything to them. You see that? The Lord said, don't give what you have that's holy or precious to people like that. He said, not only are they going to trample them, your holy things and your pearls under their feet, but they're going to turn again and rend you. You know what that means? That means you give away something precious. Sometimes you give away things that you only have one of. You only have one first love. You only have one time to be a virgin. You only have a certain amount of time in your life to be young. These are the things you have one of. And the Lord said, not only are they going to walk on it, but then they're going to turn again and rend you. To rend means to, to rip apart, to tear. The Lord said, they're going to tear your life apart. Maybe that's happened to you, or I'm sure you've seen it happen to somebody you know. They got involved with the wrong person. Everybody tried to tell them to leave that woman alone, leave that man alone, leave that boy alone, leave that girl alone, and they didn't listen. What happened to their lives after that? Think about it. What happened to their lives? They just got torn apart. See, the Lord already told us that. Oh, the Lord already told us that. He already told us that's what's going to happen when you get involved with people that are living on the dog level and the pig level. When you're dealing with people that just run around town, just sleeping with everybody, don't care when they're comfortable living in slop. That's how you know when you're not living on that level because you can't stay in slop. If you've got any kind of slop, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> slop in your life, spiritual slop, natural slop, you know, you need to clean your space up, financial slop, whatever, or let's say you have broken relationships, you don't like living in stuff like that. You don't like messy situations. You like things to be resolved. You like things to be neat and clean. You like things to be in order. That's a sign that you are not living on the swine level because if you were, you'd be comfortable in slop. And the Lord says you cannot give holy precious things to people that are comfortable living in slop. They're going to trample them holy precious things under their feet, and then they're going to turn and tear your life apart. Now can you see some of the trouble we could have avoided in our marriages if we had just listened to what the Lord said in the Word? 
Okay, we're going to do a few more of these, and then I'll move on to the next section. Um, okay, we're going to read 1 Kings 11. Now, I have to warn you <laughs> before I read this. This is one of the most ironic and tragic situations in the Bible. And the reason this is ironic and tragic is because it's like one of those things where you give advice and you give counsel, and then you don't listen to your own counsel. That's what happened to King Solomon. That's why it's so tragic. God told the Hebrews not to get involved with foreigners, strangers, with Gentiles, with people that worshiped other gods besides Jehovah. And King Solomon spent a lot of time in the scriptures talking about that himself. And then when he got old, he ended up doing the very thing he he said not to do. He ended up doing it himself. It's one of the biggest tragic stories in the Bible. After God blessed Solomon with all that wisdom, he was legendary. People would come from other countries to hear his counsel. He was so rich, he had six gold lions uh, on the steps up to his throne. And he was so rich, all of his cups were made out of gold. Like he wouldn't drink out of silver cups. He had so much money. God blessed him just, just beyond imagining. And then he waited till he got old and then did the very thing he wasn't supposed to do. And here it go. First Kings chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Those are all Gentile nations that aren't Hebrews. Of the nations, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them. Neither shall they come in to you. God saying, don't have sex with them. Don't get married to them. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Now once, see this is why people amaze me when they say that the Bible is not prophetic. The entire Bible is prophetic. When people say, well, ain't no more prophets today. Ain't no more apostles today. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is prophetic. God says, don't get involved with them. For they surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And then verse 2 says, Solomon clave unto these in love. In other words, them very folks that God told Solomon to leave alone, he just held on to them. Haven't you ever seen that? You've done that or you've seen somebody do it. With the very people they should have cut loose a long time ago, they hold on to them. They can't let them go. Okay? He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Wow. 700 wives, that man got married 700 times, 700 times, and that's still one enough, and 300 concubines. 700 wives, 300, that's a thousand women. <laughs> and then it said, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, in verse 4, for it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So in other words, King David let his flesh get out of control, but he never worshipped anybody besides God. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for, for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Let me tell you a little bit about Moloch, the false god of Moloch. They would sacrifice their children to Moloch by burning them with fire. And the way they burned them was they built a brass statue and they had the brass statue with his hands out. Then they superheated the statue in a furnace until it was super hot. Then they put a baby in the hands of that scalded hot statue and the baby would die. That's how they would sacrifice their children to Moloch. You can see why God said, don't begin to vow with people like that. Why God told the Hebrews, stay away from them folk. And Solomon loved them and married them. And, and the Lord, uh, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed them to their gods. Solomon did the very thing God told them not to do and got involved with the very people God warned him against and they turned his heart. They turned his heart. Many times you get involved with the wrong people, you think you're going to change them. 
If their heart is not already right with God, you are not the Savior. You're not going to save them. That's another huge mistake we make. You overestimate your, your, your strength or whatever it is you think you are as a person because you think you're going to save somebody else. No, you won't. They're going to turn your heart. That's why God said, leave them alone. Okay? Uh, verse 9, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. God told Solomon ahead of time, don't get involved with those people that are worshiping them false gods. And Solomon did it anyway. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. God told Solomon, point blank, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to a servant of yours. I will take the kingdom of Israel out of your hands and give it to a servant of yours. And you know what, the, what else the Lord did? The Lord split the nation of Israel. And that's when they became the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and the southern kingdom, kingdom, which was Judah. And they never recovered from that because of Solomon's sin. You see that? That's how deep this is. Did you know that sin in the highest office of the land can divide a nation? But don't look at King Solomon and don't look at the highest office of the land. It's true in your house. Because if you're involved with strange people, it's going to divide your family. That division, that rending, that tearing, that civil war is going to get in your family if that's what you're doing. So God tells us ahead of time, don't get involved with people like that. Now, can you see what I've been saying all night? that one of the most fundamental mistakes we make in modern Christianity is being reactive. You wait until something has happened, then you try to fix it. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you which people to avoid before you go over there, before you get involved. God tells you don't get involved with these types, and that's what I've been talking about all night. Can you see that? Now, can you see why some of the situations that you found yourself in or you've seen other people get in? Or maybe it's a situation with one of your children. Maybe you're the parent in the situation and you know good and well that person, your boy, your girl is dating is wrong for them and it looks like they just don't want to hear you. Let me tell you something about what the devil does. The devil anoints someone to come in your life and destroy you. Because the devil can anoint people too. The, we say the anointing, but to anoint means to take oil and it means to rub it and smear it all over. The devil can take his spirit and fill somebody with it and anoint them. That person that the devil sends in your life is designed to bring the worst out in you. Every one of your worst qualities will be what that person makes come to the surface when they're in your life. That is the mark and the sign of someone anointed by Satan to come destroy you and throw you off track. Did you know that? And not only that, but that person is going to show up in your life between the ages of 14 and 21. Did you know that? Did you know that between the ages of 14 and 21, the devil has already prepared someone that he's anointed and designed to destroy you. That's why so many of us that don't live holy when we're young, you have that one relationship that looked like it just drove you crazy. It made you become somebody that you're not. It made you do things that you're ashamed of. Maybe you gave away your virginity and your purity, or maybe you started rebelling against your parents, or maybe you stopped coming to church, or maybe you stopped praying. Uh, but one way or the other, when that person came in your life, the behavior that started coming out of you was the worst parts of you. It was the lowest parts of you. It was the parts of you that needed to be crucified that you needed to avoid it. That person is anointed by the devil. It's one of the oldest tricks of Satan to anoint someone to bring out the worst in you. And they're going to come in your life and everything that's wrong with you, everything that's bad about you that you need to be trying to overcome, they're going to magnify and bring it to the surface. Yes, they will. 
Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. And we always underestimate our own strength and get involved with them anyway. One more time. We always underestimate our own strength in these things and we get involved with them anyway. And before it's all over, you're going to end up being the worst version of you and you won't even know how it happened. You're going to wake up one day and ask yourself, how did I get here? You got there because you got involved with someone that was not God's choice for you. And they're anointed by Satan to bring out the worst in you. And the next thing you know, you're going to be crazy. And you won't even know how you got to crazy. I'll tell you how you got to crazy. You listen to someone that was anointed by Satan to bring out the worst in you. They're going to come in your life between the ages of 14 and 21 or 14 and 25. It's going to be in that slot. It's going to be pretty much right after you go through puberty, somewhere in your early 20s. Count on it. Did you know that? Did you know that the devil's been setting that up for you and for your children? Because Satan knows if he hits us early in life, he can change the entire course of our lives if he gets us when we're young. Why do you think so many people end up not becoming all that they're supposed to be? Because they got involved with the wrong person. Why do you think so many people look up at 40 and 50 and they're trying to live their dream then? Do you know why? Because they didn't get on track when they were young. Do you know why? Because they were too busy fornicating. Too busy fornicating, making babies out of wedlock, sleeping with a bunch of people, and getting involved with the worst possible people for you. 13, 14, 15 years old. If you survive all that, you're going to look up again. You're going to be 40. And you will have burned up all them years. Or like I said, you might be the parent in the situation and you might be trying to have this conversation with your child because you can see it coming. You can see that that person that they're just dead set on being involved with just is no good for them. And it seems like they just can't get enough of them. That's the devil trying to get in their lives and mess them up young. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you this other thing that I'm going to read this last chapter and then we're going to close out. I know there's been uh, a lot of talk for a long time about, you know, different things going on, you know, with young people. Let me tell you where your kids learn stuff from. Your kids learn stuff from other kids. It's not an adult that taught your child to smoke unless you smoke. And then, of course, they did learn it from you. But if you don't smoke and you find out your child is lighting up, you know who taught them that? Other kids. If you wanted your child to stay a virgin before they got married and you believe very strongly in sexual purity and then you find out your son is tipping, tipping and dipping out there laying with girls or you find out your daughter come up pregnant and she gave away her virginity, who taught her that? Other kids. First time in your life you had a drink. If you struggle with alcohol, don't anybody start drinking at 40. <laughs> if you struggle with alcohol, you got lit for the first time when you was young. Who taught you that? other kids first time you watched pornography wasn't no adult that taught you that who brought you porn the first time you watched porn who brought that to you people in your own age range other kids so what's my point my point is that that's how the devil gets in people's lives early do it in people that you're dating then people that you're dating that are anointed by the devil to bring out the worst in you they're going to make you give away your purity. They're going to make you give away your virginity. They're going to mess your name up. They're going to mess your mind up. And they're going to introduce habits in your young life that you're going to spend decades trying to get over if you live to see later years. Because don't nobody start smoking at 40. Don't nobody start drinking at 40. Don't nobody start watching porn at 40. Don't nobody start cheating at 40. If you're doing all that 40 and 50 years of age, you started that when you was young. And you started out when you was young because somebody brought it in your life. Because you wouldn't listen to what the Bible says, what I've been talking about all night. That God tells you what kind of people to not get involved with. God tells you ahead of time. Remember I told you the whole Bible is prophetic. Now you ought to be able to see how way later in the game we done went through all these changes and had all these problems and been through a divorce or two or three or maybe you got sets of kids. Maybe you got a baby by this one and a baby by that one and two by this one. You know where all that started? That started in your youth. That didn't start when you was 40. That started in your youth. 
because you let the wrong kind of person in your life, in your bed, and in your head. And God tells us in the scripture to avoid that. And that's why so many people got their lives off track and spent years trying to come back to the Lord, trying to come back to church, trying to come back and get their lives back in order. That just started with you when you was 45 years old. Maybe you came back to church when you was 45. But all that stuff you're dealing with started when you was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Because somebody in your age range came in your life and introduced false gods to you. They introduced things to you that were not of Christ. Fornication, having sex out of wedlock is not of Christ. Pornography is not of Christ. Cheating, having bad character, not being faithful to your word, but you know you've made a commitment to one person, but you're having sex with another. Cheating, that's not of Christ. Um, being out of control because of a substance, because of weed, because of liquor, because of something you shot in your arm, because of pills, being out of control. Because the Bible says, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. All those things got introduced in our lives as young people by the people we were dating. Because we didn't listen to what the Lord was saying. Can you see it now? Can you see how this, this reaps a harvest? Your teens, your 20s, your 30s, decades of your life gone, invested in the wrong people. Decades of your life spent in rehab, losing job after job because you, you, you keep getting lit or, or whatever it is you're dealing with. Decades of your life dealing with a lust spirit because you gave yourself to lust spirits when you're a young person. You got involved with porn, you're really promiscuous, and you don't understand that those open the door for lust spirits to come in your life. And you got involved with that when you were young. Then now you didn't burn up decades of your life struggling with that. And by the time you look up again, you're 40 or 50. How did that happen? It's because somebody brought a false God in your life when you were young. A false God in your life when you were young. A false God in your life when you were young. And it sent your life in all the wrong direction. And as we know, I'm sad to say, some people never come back, if you didn't know that. Some people walk away from God when they're young, and they never come back. I personally saw that happen more than once. I'm not going to name the names. But I, I knew someone when I was in high school, when we were young, that used to say things like, I want to live for the Lord. You know, I want people to know I'm saved. I want to just like I'm saved. And they were really committed. And then as time went on, they got involved in more and more out there things, ended up dying of AIDS when they was 30. So from 13 to 30, I watched them change completely to somebody else that they weren't supposed to be, and they died. I uh, was over a friend's house, and this was someone that I knew from a church, and this was when I was very, very young, and this friend uh, and I went to the same church, and they said, well, you know, I tried that Jesus thing, but I'm going to do it this way now. I remember as they spoke those words that, well, I'm going to try it this way because uh, maybe that Jesus stuff wasn't working or whatever. And less than six months later, they were dead and, and left their wife a widow with all their kids. And this was many, many years ago. I'm saying that to say that everybody that walks away from Christ doesn't always come back. Many times in church, you hear people giving these testimonies about how, you know, God kept me, I went through all this, and I was rebellion, and I ran away from God, I did this, I did that. Then I came back and praised the Lord, I'm on track, and they 40, 50, or 60. I stopped by to tell you, do not count on that happening in your life. You can't count on that happening, because some people walk away from Christ, and they never come back. They die. They die in the wilderness. They go out there, away from the Lord, go out there fooling with the wrong folks, and fooling with the wrong thing, and they die. They never live to see even middle age. I've seen it. I'm not making this up. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it uh, with people I know in my own life. Turn away from Christ and die at a young age. So this is what I mean when I tell you that as believers, 21st century believers, we have to stop being reactive and start being proactive and start telling our children and our grandchildren and any young person we have an opportunity to minister to, learn how to listen to God when you are young and do not let anybody 
bring a false God into your life. Because they are, if they are bringing something in your life that is not of Christ, it's going to destroy you. It's not fun. I mean, it's the pleasures of sin. It feels good and it looks good, but I'm saying the end thereof is death. Because don't nobody start all them habits that you wish you could get rid of? Haven't you ever seen them commercials where people are, are taking their jaw out and taking their teeth out, doing a whole bunch of stuff because they smoked a hole in their jaw? They smoked themselves into cancer. They didn't start smoking when they was 40. They started smoking when they was 14. Because all that stuff happens in your life when you're young. And it's coming from other kids. Because you let someone in your life that interfered with your commitment with Christ. And they brought them habits. That you're going to spend the next 30 years of your life trying to get rid of. You got hooked on porn when you was young. Now you can't be faithful to your spouse. Because you're addicted to pornography. Got hooked on liquor when you were young, and now you can't have any money because you spent all your money on liquor. That don't start at 40. I can't stress that enough. Okay? All right, I'm going to read this chapter, and then I'm going to close out. Now, <clears throat> if you didn't know it, God has what I call uh, a Jerry Springer chapter in the Bible. <laughs> God has what I call a Maury Povich chapter in the Bible. Really, Prophet Taylor? Yeah, really. really. It's Leviticus chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's the third book in the Bible, third book in the Old Testament, written by Moses. Okay? First five books in the Bible. We uh, Gentiles, we Protestants, call them the Pentateuch. The Jews, the Hebrews, call them the Torah. They were written by Moses, the great lawgiver. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, Moses wrote them five. So Leviticus is the third one. Leviticus chapter 18. I'll start at verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwell, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you, you shall not do nor shall you walk in their ordinances. Look at what God said. God said, you don't practice the stuff that I brought you out of, and you don't practice the stuff of the people around you of the land I'm bringing you into. Plain as day. Uh, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She's your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father or the daughter of your mother. Whether born at home or elsewhere, their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you shall not uncover. For theirs is your own nakedness. What is God talking about there? God had to tell them, don't get involved with your close relatives. <laughs> It's not funny. I want you to read Leviticus chapter 18 where the, the Bible gets raw. And God is talking about all the relationships you ain't supposed to have. And, and most of it is like incest. Right there in the Bible. Why would God have to put that in the Bible? Because some people do stuff like that. And God said, that's the wrong way to go. Uh, the nakedness of your father. Even talk about your grandchildren. Don't get involved with your can't. The nakedness of your son's daughter. That's your granddaughter. Uh, the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father. She's your sister, blah, 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 blah. That's in the Bible. Is it? Re read Leviticus 18. You see, I'm not making it up. That's in the Bible. People doing it, good, wicked, nasty things. God told his children, don't you be living like that. Don't you be living like that. Right there in the scriptures. Can you see it? Okay. So. What I've been laboring hard tonight to talk about, because I'm getting ready to close out right now. What I've been laboring hard to talk about tonight is how God already tells us in the scripture who to avoid getting involved with. And so many of the problems that we've had in our marriage or marriages, or if you're a marriage counselor or if you're a pastor, so much of the stuff you see is because we didn't listen from the beginning. And we need to start preaching and teaching and telling people to listen to God before you get involved with someone. Don't wait until after the fact and then try to fix it. That might cost you 20 years to life. You might not never come back. 
but let's begin to preach and teach, to listen to God and what the scriptures already say before we get involved with people so we can get on the right track when we're young, so we can get on the right track for the first time, and so we don't have to compromise our walk with God because of a romantic or sexual or marital relationship, okay? So there's a lot more I have to say on this subject, but i got to close up for now, okay? So if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen right now. Now, uh, as you hear me say all the time, uh, when you see me close my eyes and I'm speaking in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost who in the audience needs physical healing. And I'm also asking the Holy Ghost which kind of unclean spirits and demons need to be cast out. So when you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, that's what I'm doing. So if I have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Okay? If we don't have any prayer requests, all right, then uh, let me ask the Spirit. Okay, God is saying somebody's right eye is messed up. Somebody's right eye is hurting them, okay? So if you're out there watching me live or if you're watching this replay, if your right eye is hurting you, do this. Put your hand over your eye and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command my right eye to be every whit whole. All my blood vessels, all my blood flow, I command pain and headaches to go away. And I command my vision to be restored 100%, and I will be seeing 20-20, Right now, I command any scales to fall off my eye, and I command my vision to be every whit whole in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I command it. Amen. And amen. And your eye will be every whit whole if you pray like I just told you. Okay? All right. God is saying somebody's teeth are acting up. All right. Specifically, I saw your top row of teeth. So put your hand on your mouth and say, In the name of Jesus, I command my teeth to be every whit whole. I speak against any pain and I curse you and I dry you up from the root. I command the nerve endings, the root, the blood flow, the enamel, my gums, every part of my mouth to be every whit whole and straight. And let the pain go away. Let it dry up from the root. Let my teeth be 100% whole. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And if you need braces, speak your braces. Speak either that your teeth will straighten out on their own. Speak that you will get a good deal and a good discount on some dental work to get your braces if that's what you need. Okay? Ooh. Ooh. Okay, the Holy Ghost is telling me that somewhere out there there's a spirit of murder. There's a spirit of murder. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak to you directly, you spirit of murder. I cast you out. Whatever you're trying to do to get in somebody's head, to make a man somebody's life, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I cast you out, spirit of murder. Get off that person. Break off their head. Break off their heart. Break off of everybody in that house or that situation. I command you to flee from them because the demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. You shall not cause them to shed blood and take a life. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I break the curse of murder. That curse is broken, and we shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is also telling me that if you are in a domestic violence situation, it's time for you to get out. You were not put on this earth for somebody else to beat up on you. Do you know how we know that's true? Because Jesus don't treat us that way. The Lord does not come in your life to beat up on you. I just want you to think about that. Okay, and he is the bridegroom. He is our heavenly husband, and we are the bride. We are his wife. If the Lord does not come in our lives and beat up on us, you don't have to put up with that from no other human. So, so yeah, yeah, there's somebody that's in a situation. You need to flee. Flee for your life. You don't have to put up with that one more day. Okay? Okay, Holy Ghost is telling me it's time for believe it's time to believe for reconciliation for your children. Okay? So here's what we're gonna do. If you're watching me live and you have a child you want to reconcile with, put your hand on the screen. Put your hand on whatever device you're watching me on. Okay? 
You add your faith to mine, and I add my faith to yours. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we claim that God that is able to reconcile us to him by the blood of his cross is able to reconcile us to our wayward children, our estranged children, by that same blood. I don't care how bad it's been. I don't care how ugly it got. I don't care how many arguments you had. If you have a son or a daughter out there that you need to reconcile with, I add my faith to yours and you add your faith to mine. In the name of Jesus, we claim the spirit of reconciliation because God vented his wrath on Christ on the cross. If God was able to reconcile us through the blood of his cross, he's able to reconcile us to our estranged children and loved ones through that same blood. So in the name of Jesus, we speak reconciliation and the repairing of the breach and the restoring of the relationship and the restoring of families. For God says we must turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. All right? In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare it. Amen. Now believe that and say that every day. Okay? And if ever you feel weak or underconfident, do what you just saw me do. Go find somebody to agree with you in prayer and faith and hold their hand. Add your faith to theirs and add their faith to yours so that we will believe that that estrangement and that, that broken relationship will be no more. But that son or that daughter is going to reconnect with you and you're going to have a relationship that's going to be so sweet, it's like the past never happened. How do we know that's possible? Because that's how it is with us and Jesus. Think about how it was when you were estranged from God. If there was ever a point in your life where you, where you weren't thinking about no God, and look at how you love the Lord now. Look at how you love his glory now. Look at how you love his name now. Look at how you love his precious Holy Spirit now. Look at how you love his word. Look at how you love the prophetic. You weren't always there. What happened? God reconciled us to him. If God is able to do that for us, he can do that for us and our children. But we have to believe it and we have to say it and we have to stand fast until it manifests. You hear me say all the time, you don't have the full manifestation until you have it in your hand. Okay? You have to have it in your hand. That person's got to be back in your life. Okay? All right. Okay, I have a prophet, prophetic word to release, and we're going to pray and clo close out. For behold, my children, says the Lord, the time comes, and yea, now is, where I call my children unto me, to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For I have told you in my word that you cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of my mouth. Therefore, my children, I release unto you a spirit of detail. I release unto you a spirit of diligence. I release unto you a spirit of patience and waiting in my presence so that I might give you every word that I have to give you over a situation. For no more do I want to see my children in bad marriages. No more do I want to see my children abused or confused. But I want you to be married to the person that I have ordained for you to be married to. You are married to me first. I am first. And if it is my will for you to have a spouse, I will send them to you and send you to them. And I will make it known unto you and to them that this relationship is of me by my mighty anointing and my mighty spirit and the power of my word. So come unto me, my people. Believe in me and listen to every word that I speak to you, and I will straighten out your crooked places. And every place in your life you have gone astray. I am the good shepherd, and I will set you on the paths of life and lead you to green pastures and to still waters, says the spirit of the living God. Amen, amen. And that blessed my heart. That blessed my heart. See, that's just like the Lord. Even if we have gone astray, he's able to bring us back. So I'm taking that word. I'm receiving that word, that word that the Holy Ghost just gave. I'm receiving that. So if there's ever been a path you went on in the past that was wrong, look to the good shepherd. You have to spend time in his presence. You have to spend time in his word. You have to spend time in his glory. And as you do that, he will give you every word you need to straighten out your crooked place. Good God Almighty. Well, that's a blessing in my heart. That's a blessing in my soul. So amen. So that's all for tonight. Um, I will be back on this Sunday. 
at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I know today was Valentine's Day. It's kind of appropriate that, you know, we want to celebrate, celebrate this day in love, which means we got to avoid the bad relationships and get into the right ones. Uh, I will be back uh, next second Thursday in March because, again, I come on the second Thursday, 7 o'clock. I'll be on this Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And those of you that follow me on Facebook, I actually have a book release that I'm starting tomorrow. There's going to be a launch party at the end of this month. And I'm going to give you the details on that tomorrow. So if you follow me on Facebook, on my personal account, check that out too. It's a children's book, so we'll check that out. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, I'm always blessed by the Word of God. I love to hear from the Holy Ghost. I love to hear from the Lord because everything the Lord says gives you life and changes your life. And it makes the crooked places straight. So thank you so much for tuning in, those of you that watch me live and those of you that watch, watch the replay. So God bless you. We're going to do what the Lord said do. We're going to spend time in his presence, and we're going to start listening to every word Excuse me, the Lord has to say. And he's going to take our crooked places and make them straight. All right? Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Valentine's Day, and have a great night.